to share with me the call to worship, which is coming up now. You get the bits in italics and colours and red. We are here in the name of Christ Jesus. We are here to worship God. No one's ever seen God. We have not seen Jesus. We cannot see the Spirit, yet by faith we worship. Yes, by faith we worship the God Emmanuel, for he has come as light and love to us all. The light of the Lord Jesus be with you all, and also with you. Uh, pray with me. Uh, some of the bits in here, you, you'll see which bits are yours. Most holy friend, hidden from our eyes, yet made knowable in Mary's holy son. Through him we approach you with confidence. We begin this service with eagerness. We continue it with eager faith. And we shall end it with renewed courage. We pray in the name of Christ Jesus who with you and the Holy Spirit are worthy of our utmost love, praise and service. Amen. We're going to stand up and sing in Christ alone. Will you join us? Yeah. 
Would you pray with me? Father, we bow before you in humble and grateful adoration and worship. We have come safely through a, a year of significant difficulties that have been troubling for many. Starting with unprecedented fires countrywide, many are still struggling with the consequences of these. Although as a state we have managed to come through a year of COVID-19 problems relatively safely, on a world scale, many countries have struggled to deal with this adequately. Even though we see positive signs of vaccines to combat this pandemic, an adequate solution or adequate rollout of immunisation worldwide is unlikely for most of this year. So for many, 2021 is unlikely to be any better than 2020. For us, your people here at Blackwood who have come through 2020 relatively unscathed, we can only look to you in faith and hope, we commence, hope as we commence a new year. We give thanks for the staff and leadership of our church who have successfully negotiated a difficult 12 months, often giving above and beyond reasonable expectations. They have often found new and innovative ways to further your ministry among us when normal practices have been denied. As we bow before you at the start of a new year, we can only do so with words of thanks on our lips. In times of trouble, our faith in you is our anchor. And as we move forward this year, we seek your continued guidance as we look to understand the direction for your ministry here in the Blackwood area. We give thanks for the ministry of James and Craig with us. As Craig and Naomi leave for new ministry opportunities, we ask for your blessing on them as they seek your guidance and understanding for their future. We have been blessed by their presence with us and know wherever they go, others will be equally blessed. May Craig see this as a new opportunity and may he have a clear sense of your presence and direction in his life. We ask for wisdom, purpose and understanding for James and the elders as they continue to guide us as we, your church here at Blackwood, move forward into 2021. In praying for them, we understand this also involves us and so we commit to uphold, encourage and support them at all times. We also pray for Carly as she supports James helps raise her boys, Luke and Ezra, and continues to live out her faith in you as part of our church community. Father, in spite of our troubled year, we have much to be thankful for. We live in a country where we lack little and take much for granted. Give us that compassionate understanding that motivates us to be a voice for the less fortunate and to give sacrificially when we see the need. We ask your forgiveness for those times when we drift from your presence and fail to understand what you require of us. As we move into the new year, motivate and empower us to live more Christ-like lives as we seek your direction and presence. We have no clear understanding what this year holds for us, both individually or as a church, and can only move forward in faith with your presence in our lives, giving us purpose and direction. And so we give thanks for the presence of your spirit among us, empowering us to be faithful representatives of Christ as we go from this place and into the weeks and months ahead. We offer all this in your son's powerful name. Amen. If we were good Methodists, uh, the first Sunday of the new year is uh, Covenant Sunday and we'd be renewing our baptismal vows. Uh, we do get a chance to do one thing around the sacraments and that's share communion, which is coming up next. So you get the opportunity, whether you're here or at home, uh, to wrap around in your cupboards and find something, in your case, wrap around in the pews and get ready for, work for the communion. But we're going to sing It Is Well With My Soul. 
and uh, I expect all the fellows to help me. We come now together around the table to share in the Lord's Supper. So let's prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper by joining our voices together in the way our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. One of my favourite writers is Marilyn Robinson and um, I wanted to share an excerpt from her book Gilead today. Calvin says somewhere that each of us is an actor on a stage and God is the audience. That metaphor has always interested me because it makes us artists of our behaviour and the reaction of God to us might be the thought of aesthetic rather than morally judgmental in the ordinary sense. How well do we understand our role? With how much assurance do we perform it? I suppose Calvin's God was a Frenchman, just as mine is a Middle Westerner of New England extraction. Well, we all bring such light to bear on these great matters as we can. I do like Calvin's image, though, because it suggests how God might actually enjoy us. I believe we think about that far too little. It would be a way into understanding essential things, since presumably the world exists for God's enjoyment, not in any simple sense, of course, but as you enjoy the being of a child, even when he is in every way a thorn in your heart. So I think sometimes we come to the communion table with this sense that Jesus sacrifices himself out of obligation to his wayward children. But however, how often do we think that perhaps it is more so because he has created us to be his delight and joy and his beloved children. Let us pray for this meal and the offering. Almighty God, you know us and what keeps us from you. Restore our relationship with you and each other and send your spirit to make this bread and wine for us the body and blood of Jesus. And we also pray for our gifts and offering. What you have generously given, we offer back to you. Use it to further your kingdom. Amen. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my, my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The body of our Lord Jesus given for you to preserve you and deliver you to eternal life. Let us now take and eat in remembrance and thanksgiving. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The blood of our Lord Jesus given for you, the new covenant and the forgiveness of sin, let us now drink together in gratitude and hope. Good morning. This morning's reading is from Luke chapter 9, verses 1 to 6. Then Jesus called the twelve together 
and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure the Caesars. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. He said to them, take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, not even an extra tunic. Whatever house you enter, stay there and leave from there. Wherever they do not welcome you, as you are leaving that town, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They departed and went through the villages, bringing the good news and curing diseases everywhere. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Greg, Ian, Kevin and Carly for your participation in the service so far. Am I allowed to say something about a uh, rose among thorns? Is that, a, is that okay in that context? If you don't know me, uh, my name is James. I'm a minister here. And if you really don't know me, perhaps most importantly, the community of Carly is my wife. It's not creepy. Um, it's really good to have you here with us this morning for the first Sunday in 2021. Happy New Year to you all. It's uh, kind of my hope and prayer that this year, for, for me personally, but also for all of you, in person or tuning in as well, that this might be a year of deep encounter with God, a year where you might know his love and his joy more profoundly. And if you do feel like you're in a bit of a rut at the moment, or uh, you know things aren't just going so well, a year where you can be snapped out of that, the scales can fall from the eyes, the weight can lift from the shoulders, whatever it is, either with your circumstances changing or in the midst of those circumstances. I think that song, It Is Well, captured that so well. I mean, a lot of you know the, the background behind that, the great pain and suffering that the author of that song went through and the possibility of there being joy and growth and transformation in the midst of that. We are going to dive into that reading that we just heard, but just before I begin that, I invite you to pray with me. <clears throat> Our loving God, we thank you that you are with us right now. We thank you that you care for us deeply, that you are closer to us than we are to ourselves. And we ask that you would be at work in our hearts and minds this morning, that you would animate us, transform us, revive us, that you would bring us to life. In your name we pray. Amen. Now prior to this reading in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus' closest friends and disciples had been with him for months at this stage. They had been working closely with him, watching him, observing him, learning from him, and working alongside of him. And then at this point in the Gospel of Luke, this story of the life of Jesus, it's a bit of a pivot. Things change. And Jesus sends out his disciples with a mission, with a purpose. They are to go forth and start a movement that will bring healing and restoration and justice to millions. That's what he's doing. He's sending them out. And so he says to them as he sends them out, the first thing you've got to do is get started on social media. Get the hashtag restoration for all trending. And once you've got enough interest going, once the social media starts to turn around and get, starts to build up, hold an a in-person rally. Show people how many people are on your side. And once you get that bit of movement, that momentum, then you should be able to pick up some rich benefactors to help you out to cash roll the movement. And then you can hire a PR director, a campaign manager, a donor liaison, a uh, managing director, and most importantly, a graphic designer. Finally, at that point, your movement is ready to storm local and federal government to campaign politicians, and then you'll see some real change coming about from this movement. You'll see restoration and justice coming to all. So that's what we would say if we were going to start a movement to transform the world. Of course, it's nothing like what Jesus said. His first step and his first instruction to his disciples to start this movement was quite a bit different. He tells them to go to town to town to find the people who are open to them, who welcome them in, and then bring about healing and proclaim the good news that Jesus, uh, God is restoring all things. He's setting all things right in Jesus. You see, the world-changing movement that the disciples were launching here 
stance with them going from town to town and paying attention in those places to who was welcoming them in, who was open to them, who wanted them there, who was receptive to them and willing to learn from them. You know, as followers of Jesus, I think maybe intuitively, or perhaps incorrectly, we maybe assume that it's our job to minister to, to teach, to disciple, to pass on the good news about Jesus, in particular to those people who hate us and are disinterested in us and are opposed to it all. Many, many years ago, I was volunteering in a high school, helping out the chaplain there. And we went in one day, and they ended up getting a bunch of churches in the area to come in and provide some entertainment for the teenagers. I think there was a a band or something like that, maybe someone doing skate tricks. As typical with churches, it was something that was okay and trying to be cool, but didn't really quite land, but that's okay. Um, The main reason we were there was just to talk with the students and to build connections and all sort of that thing. And it was going pretty well for me. I was having a good time there until I bumped into this one teenage boy, 13-year-old, short fella, who had that sort of stupid, fiery determination that only a 13-year-old boy can have at times. He came, he saw me, he goes, oh, so you're here to be my friend, are you? I'm like, well, if you, we can talk if you want to. Are you here to help me out, are you? Oh, let's see how this goes. Come on, tell, give it to me, give it. I just went on and on and on like this. And at the time, I kind of thought like maybe him, this guy who was opposed to me, he was putting up his barriers to me, he obviously wanted nothing to do with this church thing that we were coming from, was the very one that I was meant to be investing most of my time into, that I was meant to be putting most of my energy into ministering to and, and telling him about Jesus. That's what I thought at the time, but as I read passages like this and others in the Gospels, I don't think that's the case. We're definitely called to love our enemies to care for them, to pray for them, to wish the best for them. But I think what Jesus is saying here is that it is not our place to invest in them, to teach them, to disciple them, to make sure that they understand the gospel. It's just not something we can do. No, instead, we are called to pay attention to those people who are open to us, who are welcoming us, who are receptive to us, who are interested in hearing from us instead. Those are the people we are called to invest in. Those are the people we are called to teach, to minister to. This year, in 2021, you might not be going from town to town like the disciples. In fact, there's a good chance you legally can't go from state to state at least. But you will go from house to work. You will go to your neighbours. You will go to your schools, to your local parks, to all of these. And as we go in 2021, may we pay attention like those disciples did to those people who welcome us in, to those people who are receptive to us, to those people who seem eager to hear from us and perhaps even like us, I think we should pay attention to all these people because there's a very good chance God has sent us to them. That maybe God has heard their cries of their innermost spirit, the cries that they don't even know how to articulate. They're longing for meaning and purpose. They're longing for restoration. They're longing to be connected in with God, with this infinite goodness and beauty and love, even if they can't name it, even if they don't believe it. Maybe God has heard those cries from within their spirit and he has sent you to be an answer to that cry. Maybe he has sent you to invest in them. Maybe he has sent you to care about them, to stick with them. Maybe he has sent you to represent him, to represent God to them, to pass on the good news at the appropriate time. As the disciples went forth on their mission to transform the world, to start a movement that would transform the world, the first thing they did was pay attention to those people who welcomed them in, who received them. They learned to see that they were people that God had put in their lives to minister to. As we continue this mission in 2021, might we have eyes to do the same? But of course, the disciples' mission didn't finish there. They went on. They also 
healed and proclaimed the good news about Jesus. They proclaimed the news that the answer to the problems of the world and the answer to the problems in our lives is found in Jesus, even if it's not exactly the answer we were looking for. Now, I think there might have been times for the disciples where they proclaimed first and then healed after, but I suspect more often than not, it actually happened the other way around, that they went about doing wonderful, miraculous, life-giving things, and then in response to that, people asked, how are you doing this? Which opened the door for them to pass on the news about Jesus who made it all possible in the first place. And it makes sense, doesn't it? If someone came into the town and through their prayers someone got healed, if this life-giving, joyous, wonderful, seemingly impossible thing would happen, it would make sense that someone would follow up with how do you do that and how can I connect into the same. Now, as we go into 2021 and as we interact with those people who welcome us in that God might have put in our lives, we might have miraculous answers to our prayers for them. I mean, I know people for whom that has happened. But we might not as well. But no matter what, I guarantee, without doubt, that you can do something for them and in their lives that is life-giving and joyous and seemingly impossible. You can do something for them. You can do something with them for which there is no explanation for why you would do that or why you would be able to do that if it wasn't for the fact that Jesus had been at work in your life. A while ago, many years ago now, when Carly and I were volunteering with the green team for schoolies, those group of churches that go down and minister to and support the um, uh, school leavers down at Victor Harbour as they have their uh, end of year 12 party down there. We weren't too on the ground, we were more of a supervisor position, which feels a bit cushy now, but we paid close attention to it. We got to see those who were really on the ground. And this year we were working with the bus team and my hat goes off to the bus team. What would happen on the first day these uh, young adults from different churches in Adelaide, they would start off in the caravan parks around Victor Harbour where the school leavers were staying. And then when the school leavers got on the bus, the uh, green team people, the volunteers, the Christian volunteers would get on with them. And by this time already, um, how do I put this? Um, the school leavers weren't overly thirsty anymore. They had a little bit to drink. But the green team would welcome them on. There would be no judgment passed. There would be no why you're doing this. It was always about being engaging and being there for them. And inevitably, as this warm bus with the heating on, going down winding roads begin with a lot of a certain substance in the stomach, the vomiting would start on the bus. And the green team people would do the best they could to try and catch this vomit with the, uh, the bags that they had for them. And inevitably, more than once, it would be a little bit too coming too quickly. Someone didn't know what happened. They'd turn to the side. It would just end up on top of all of the volunteers and all of that. And, but no matter what, even when you got vomited on, they were always very nice and they helped out and they tried to get them into, you know, to sort themselves out. And do you know what? By the end of that bus trip, the schoolies had two questions. The first was, how much do you get paid for this? And when they answered, we actually pay to come here, the second question was always, without a shadow of a doubt, why are you doing this? <laughs> to which the natural answer for many of them was, because it's my faith. Because Jesus compelled me to come here. Because I've experienced a kindness like this from God as well. I'm not suggesting that you go get vomited on in a bus. But I suspect that there are some things you can do for the people around you in 2021 that will cause them to question, why are you doing this? There are acts of kindness, acts of generosity, acts of love to your friends and your neighbours and your colleagues that will cause them to look and think, this is impossible. Why on earth would you do this? To which the answer is, my faith compels me because I've experienced love first. 
This is the second thing the disciples did as they headed out, and as in 2021, it's something we can do as well. To pray for people, and if there's a miraculous answer to that, great. But if not, to still do acts of kindness and generosity and love that would seem impossible without God. Not for some ulterior motive, not because we're forcing ourselves to, but when it flows out of the work of God in us, out of graciousness and generosity and thankfulness, that's when people will start to ask, why are you doing this? The final thing, which we've already hinted at the disciples did, was, of course, was proclaim the good news about Jesus to let these people know that Jesus is setting all things right, which perhaps doesn't come naturally to us in our context. If we're thinking about bringing healing and restoration and wholeness, our go-to, our first step, and perhaps our only step, would be instead to direct people towards a good doctor or a good psychologist or to help them get their finances sorted out. All things that are important, but not what Jesus here suggests is most important for the transformation of the world. And I think Jesus puts this first, and he puts this as a most important, because he knows something that we all too often forget. And it's that if you don't resolve the spirit, if you don't resolve the spiritual issues for a person, a community, a culture then none of the physical or social or emotional answers will stick for very long either. I've forgotten his name and I can't find the article, but it was a while ago I was using, reading an article from a British newspaper. It was an, an atheist uh, man, a journalist, who had grown up in Africa. And he'd watched for years and years and years all of these Western social uh, development and community development agencies come in and do what they could to make a difference. And he also watched different missions come in from different churches. And this atheist, well-educated, intelligent journalist came to a conclusion that disturbed him at the end of it. He watched everything that had happened and he wrote an article for this newspaper and he says, I can't believe I'm saying this, but Africa needs Jesus. Because he had seen time and time again that although the social development and the community work was doing good work and that was great, it just struggled to stick while the spiritual issues, the issues around people's identity and what they trusted in and their worldview were left unchanged. Whereas he had seen that happen through the proclamation of good news. I know it's super intimidating, sharing your faith, talking about Jesus. It's the last thing that we want to do. But I urge us as we head into 2021 to at least not close the door to it because it might bring about a, a depth of healing and restoration for people that we wouldn't be able to help out with anything otherwise. I suspect that part of the fear is taken away when we realize that sharing your faith isn't about knocking on some random person's door it's not about finding the person who's the most opposed to faith and then trying to convince them. It comes about by paying attention to those who are welcoming you and receiving you. And it comes about when they see the change that Jesus has made in your life and start asking questions. But when that comes up, may we at least pray for, start to think about, consider having the courage to respond truthfully about who Jesus is and what he's done for us, even if we don't have all the answers at the time. Throughout the gospel, of the, letter, the um, book of Acts in the New Testament, which is actually the sequel to this gospel of Luke. The gospel of Luke finishes with the story of Jesus rising again and speaking with his disciples. <clears throat> and then Acts takes off the story with those disciples. It shows how the movement, which starts here, begins to spread. And there's amazing things that happen in that brief period of time. There are girls in slavery who are set free. There is an economy of a town that was entirely based on the rich manipulating the poor with the promise of magic that would be effective. There's an entire economy that's turned on its head and made more just in the book of Acts. There are, there's racial divisions in the book of Acts which are healed, and we know at our world at the moment just how hard that is. But the thing that provides the breakthrough for each of these things to happen in all those times isn't good social planning. It isn't good health care. It isn't 
good psychology, as important as all those things are, the thing that provides the breakthrough in the Gospel of Act, in the Book of Acts, sorry, is when they proclaim that Jesus is Lord, that He was resolving the problems of the world, and that there is a powerful transformation that happens in people's life through hearing that. Again, I know it's intimidating. I'm not very good at it. But when we have those opportunities to share our faith come up, when we look at grabbing them, because it might do something so amazing in the life of the person we're talking to that we would be remiss to not let them have that opportunity. So when Jesus starts his mission to transform the world, a mission that will turn into a movement that will bring about healing and restoration and justice for millions. He doesn't start it off with a great hashtag and some good graphic design. He doesn't start it off with an Oxford consultant or any number of things. He starts it off by telling his friends and his disciples to go town to town as they're going about their lives, to pay attention to those who are welcoming them in, to invest in them, to bring about healing, by doing these acts of kindness and goodness and these prayers that would be impossible without the work of God and to proclaim the one who made it all possible in the first place. Seems a bit foolish to us, but Jesus must have known something that we don't because it worked. On the other side of the planet, thousands of kilometres away, 2,000 years later, here we are sitting here deeply impacted by it. May we live this same mission out in 2021. Will you pray with me? Our Lord and God, we thank you that you haven't just put us here to twiddle our thumbs, to survive, to just put enough food on the table, to just have a roof over our heads and to get by. That you've given us something to live for, a mission to join you, to hear you, in bringing about healing and restoration to this world. I think sometimes we get intimidated by what that looks like. We think it has to look big and impressive and require skills, but as we've heard this morning, it doesn't. It's just an attentiveness to you and a deep love and the courage to, to say where that came from. Please give us eyes to see as we go about. May we have a sense of this excitement and adventure in 2021, that we are on mission with you, that you could speak to us, you could put a person in our life to whom we are to love and invest in a particular way at any moment. And yes, give us again the faith to follow you when we see that. In your name we pray. Amen. Almost done. Uh, you've seen these, they're new. At least I haven't seen them before. Fill out your card if you can. If you're at home, uh, fill out your digital welcome card. That would be lovely. We'd like to get to know all of you, particularly if you're visiting. So uh, do, do do that. We're going to sing um, another Charles Wesley hymn, And Can It Be? Uh, Mrs Wesley got pregnant in about uh, 1738, I think, with uh, what was, I think, at least her 14th pregnancy. And uh, we get this song as, as a result of that. Uh, so, very grateful to that lady. And can it be that I should go?
Father, we thank you for worship today, for your call on our lives where you draw us to yourself to nourish, to forgive and to invigorate, to send us out into the world to nourish, to forgive and to invigorate. Lord God, thank you for this heavenly task that you've given to us. And now, my friends, as you go out into God's world this week, remember his promise to us, I will never leave you, neither will I ever forsake you. So go in peace, for God goes with us all. Amen. Thank you.